May the holy names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph be blessed, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on this third Sunday of Easter, the Church once again proposes to our reflection the topic of the resurrection of Jesus. There is, however, a new aspect, full of mystery, that the liturgy, through today's readings, invites us to explore. Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead in order to save the world. The fulfillment of the redemption, therefore, required the passage of Jesus through his passion, death, and resurrection. The importance of this truth is evident from the fact that already in the Old Testament there are numerous texts that speak about it, and Jesus himself announced it on several occasions. After the resurrection, appearing for 40 days, Jesus made it the privileged topic of his teaching to the apostles in order to prepare them to be later heralds and eyewitnesses of this mystery. This is also stated in today's Sunday's Gospel. The apostles gathered in the upper room spent a day full of excitement because of the shocking news they had received. Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene and to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. While they were still talking about these things, says the Gospel, Jesus appeared in their midst. The sudden apparition in the middle of the night created fear and turmoil in their hearts. They even thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus gently rebukes them, saying, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet, it is I indeed. Touch me and see, a ghost has no flesh and bones, as you see that I have. To remove any doubt from their minds, because the apostles were still looking at him with perplexity and amazement, he asked them, Have you anything to eat here? And they offered him a portion of roasted fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. When Jesus invites them to look, to touch his glorious body, and to eat with him, the wall of unbelief in the apostles falls definitively. They have the by now tangible and incontestable evidence of his resurrection. Jesus, whom they see risen in his glorious body, but still bearing the signs of his passion, is the very master who had been crucified. Once the resistance of the apostles had been overcome, Jesus opened their minds to the understanding of the scriptures and said, Thus it is written that the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. The apostles learned from the risen master all that is written about him in the scriptures. The mystery of his life and mission, his death and resurrection, and all had been precisely fulfilled. They learned from him that the mystery of his death on the cross, the necessary passage for the redemption of humanity, is a design of the Father's will. In the first reading, we see the moving speech of St. Peter, who presents the resurrection of Jesus as the fulfillment of all the prophecies and promises made by God to the people of Israel. St. Peter accuses the Jews of having denied and killed the author of life. But the will of the Father, who always triumphs over every obstacle and all the evil plans of men, and even uses the perverse will of the Jews, to so fulfill what he had announced through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would die, also brings to competition the plan of the salvation of mankind by raising his beloved Son from the dead. But St. Peter also has not forgotten his betrayal, which he will mourn for the rest of his life and the forgiveness he has received from the Lord. 
Therefore he turns to the Jews and almost apologizing says to them, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, like your leaders, and then invites them to conversion. Repent, therefore, and amend your lives, so that your sins may be forgiven. St. Peter's words are echoed by those of St. John in the second reading, who says, My dear children, I write these things to you, so that you may not sin, but if anyone has sinned, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. Today's Gospel also ends with an invitation to conversion. Jesus, who exhorts everyone to conversion, concludes by sending the Apostles to preach in his name to all nations, conversion and the forgiveness of sins. Since then, the Church continues to call her children to conversion and to return to God. There is no man who does not need conversion if he wants to be saved. Let us seriously accept the invitation of Jesus, the Apostles and the Church to renew our lives. But the vague desire is not enough. We must decide with the firm determination of our will that we want to change our lives, to cut all ties with sin. This is also what St. Pio of Pietrelcina affirms in his short discourse for Easter Day, saying that just as Jesus wanted to appear risen for 40 days and considered that he would not have done enough if after he had risen he would not have appeared, for us too it is not enough to rise in imitation of Christ if in imitation of him we do not appear risen changed and renewed in spirit. This is the true conversion we need. Jesus revealed to the apostles the meaning of the scriptures, which spoke of his death and resurrection, and of the task that Jesus entrusted to them, the charge to preach to all peoples repentance and forgiveness of sins. My brothers and sisters, if we really want to live as resurrected ones, we must change our lives, vigorously eliminate sin and do penance. In this way, we will testify that we generally love the Lord. St. John states this clearly in today's second reading, who says, By this we know that we have to come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and there is no truth in him. But whoever keeps this word, in him the love of God is truly perfect. The love of God consists in keeping his commandments, and it cannot be otherwise. When we love God, then it will be a joy for us to practice what he teaches, and to re resolutely avoid sin. When we love someone, we willingly do the will of the person we love. If I know that Jesus wants something not to be done, I will do everything I can in order not to do it, no matter what it costs. Too often we do not realize that sin is the greatest misfortune that can befall us. The saints would have preferred death a thousand and one times rather than to commit one single sin. Just think of so many martyrs whose persecutors, in order not to be tortured and put to death, had demanded that they may deny the faith of Christ and blaspheme. But they remained faithful to God and went joyfully through the greatest suffering and death. If the Christian knows, for example, that one cannot steal, that one cannot deceive one's neighbor, that one cannot commit impure acts, that marriage cannot be profaned by infidelity or the use of contraceptives, and so on. He must avoid all these things, even if it means sacrifice, trusting in God's almighty help and in prayer. If the Christian knows 
that God wants feast days to be kept holy, prayers to be said every day, good works to be done. He must do all this with joy. In this way, he will bear witness to his love for God, not just in words, but also in deeds. The month of May, which soon will begin, also represents a strong call to conversion in order to more closely resemble our mother, the Immaculate Ever-Virgin. Indeed, this month of May dedicated to her, let, let us ask her ardently, with the daily and fervent recitation of the Holy Rosary, for the grace of a definitive return to God. Let us make the proposal to follow wholeheartedly the appeals of our Lord and Our Lady at Lourdes, Fatima, and many other places, so that we may save our souls and render them pleasing to God. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph be blessed now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.